discussion. And what we would like to do now is to close the camp um, and talk um, a little bit about three themes uh, that were also, um, yeah, much of the center of the presentation and the talks and the discussions we had today, which is on one hand uh, about adoption, how cross mining can be adopted, how much is it adopted, about the data science theme, which we just heard uh, from Will, but also in earlier talks, and also about the practical application of process mining. Um, and the, the idea is just to um, um, get this um, yeah, as, a, as a conversation started, and we, we really invite you also to um, yeah, raise questions and join in uh, at, uh, at parts where you would like to um, ask something or say something. Um, in the panel today, most of the people you have met already during the day, so uh, Frank uh, was um, a speaker here and is representing um, the perspective of a company uh, very successfully um, applying process mining and the learnings that they made on the way. Um, we invited uh, Nick to participate to um, yeah, share and represent the perspective that he has from doing uh, projects uh, at their clients uh, where they are using process mining. Uh, to help them solve their problems. Um, we have Christian Günther from Flexicon, uh, who is representing the perspective of a software, um, uh, of a software vendor, someone who makes process mining software. Um, um, and then we have um, um, two other people who, um, next to Will, of course, who we just uh, met, and who is representing the research perspective, uh, who we haven't met today, which I would like to briefly introduce to you here today now. Uh, first of all, uh, we have Neil Wolfdatten. Uh, Neil is an analyst from um, MWD Advisors, and it's, um, uh, yeah, so they're observing the, the industry, um, especially in the BPM field, but also around uh, like data-related uh, fields and also processes. Um, and um, so he's representing his perspective like as an analyst, like what, how do people um, look at process mining and um, he will share some of his thoughts uh, around that. And at the same time uh, we have uh, Mark Kermans from Gartner, so on, uh, on the, let's say from the batch label, uh, you also have that analyst perspective and of course you have it, but like we discussed earlier, actually you have, you join quite some different perspectives over the time because you have also uh, work for a company that makes software but also applied it as a consultant, so you are a little bit like a, um, a combination of, of many things. Schizophrenic. <laughs> so I have, I have this, actually I have, uh, are you hearing me from this one? No. And now it's working? Yeah. Yes, okay. So because that's the only mic we have left, uh, so let's hope the battery holds up. Uh, that's the one I'm going to pass it on from the panel. And I'd like to start um, the conversation just by um, starting with Neil and Mark who are joining us here today uh, for the first time. And uh, my question to them is like, how do you see process mining you know, in, uh, from an analyst perspective? Is this something that people are asking about more now than last year. Is anybody asking about it at all? Uh, so could, could you say something about the, you know, the, the state of adoption as you see it? Okay. So thank you very much for, for letting me come. Um, and thank you for the great introduction. So um, in, in my uh, research around Europe, uh, which is where we do most of our work, uh, I have to say that you guys are all real pioneers. So Anna showed a diagram earlier with a you know, the uh, adoption curve from Jeffrey Moore, and we said we were in the early adopters. I don't think we're really even that far, mm. uh, <laughs> I think, in general. So we, we do quite a lot of surveys, as you would expect, um, and we still find, you know what, the most common things people use to improve their processes are pen and paper, that's number one, and number two, is, and three, now depending on the survey, they're different way around, PowerPoint and Visio. This is 90% of the population of businesses around Europe. So these guys are real pioneers. Now I, I do see definitely some more interest. More, we're getting more inquiries about this, but the inquiries are what on earth is this stuff it, it, and, and how is it different from other things? It's still very, very basic. So we're doing a lot of just very basic helping people understand how this might complement other things. Uh, so that's a quick answer. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Neil. So um, 
Well, we, we are covering kind of uh, questions uh, from around the entire world, uh, which is more around uh, process management. And uh, well, we have a kind of a different perspective on that, that uh, looking at the technology and all these kind of things uh, than uh, being involved in it for, for so many years. Um, well, it's kind of, to me, it's kind of mature, and, uh, but it's, it's really on the adoption. And we are Gardner, we have uh, some, well, some real nice concepts about that, uh, even before uh, the, the uh, early adopter and so on, we have a kind of what we call the hype cycle. Yeah? And uh, if you look at this hype cycle, for those who don't know, uh, the hype cycle is, okay, something exists, comes into existence in the market, then there is a lots of hype created around that, and then suddenly these hypes inflates and comes to a peak of expectations, and then it falls back into kind of a trough of disillusionment, and then it gets into a plateau of uh, productivity. In fact, uh, the, the, the one that uh, invented that uh, said that it uh, was invented based thinking on a marriage, and uh, <laughs> that, that's, <laughs> that's something completely, but that's also a nice cycle. So, but... Uh, First or second marriage? Uh, no, 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 that's a different hype cycle, and a different bullet. <laughs> no, but uh, what, what I see in the market uh, is, especially if, if I look to this hype, and especially this year, because I had to also to come up with a position on the hype cycle, based on my inquiries uh, with, with lots of people, four or five people, uh, four or five companies a day, um, then I would say that there is already a lot of hype. But this hype is created by um, a lot of people that starts coming from the academic world and, and really going into the organizations and, and starting this. And this is not only in Europe, because I see this also in, in, in Northern America, where you have a little company, Stereologic, doing the same kind of things that you are, and Fujitsu, of course. Um, so. It's, it's around, and uh, currently we see this uh, really going to the peak of expectation, really. Um, but what also is, is very important on this hype cycle is that we predict uh, how much time it will take before it goes into mature or into uh, this plateau of productivity. And uh, th from this year on, we, well, together, in, based upon these inquiries and so on, and based upon case studies that we have seen, uh, we think that uh, will be take another two to four years between it before it will go into uh, uh, productivity. But um, that's all based on the inquiries, so, so it's not based on being present everywhere, everywhere or everywhere. But uh, that's our best guess, let's say. Um, and uh, and I would have liked that it would have well taken up much quicker because I've been done. I'm one of the, the well, enthusiasts, I, I would say, in 2006-07, when, when I first came to, to know uh, process mining. But uh, that's uh, where we see the position today. And uh, I think it, will, it can only improve if you see the, 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 well, well, what's going to us in, in digital business, digitalization, Internet of Things. Well, uh, and, and also because, and, uh, that's also, we not only talk to end users, organizations, but also to vendors. Uh, I know uh, from this year on, there's a lot of interest from vendors, from process management vendors, into process mining, and you will see some things happen, in, I think, in the market, I think, second year, or second half of this year. So that's our perspective from Gardner as an analyst, the paper producing company. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's, th thank you for sharing that. I, I must say, I'm surprised that it's, Way uh, rated as a hype, but at the same time, my perception is that so little people know about it. So, how does that, that is that shared? Is that a shared perception among yourself that it's? Yeah, I think um, from our perspective, what we see with clients is that they want it, they just don't know that they want it yet, in the sense that they don't necessarily know that it, it exists in, in the form that it's there. And so, uh, and the reason I say that is because when we go into a meeting and. and for example, if you use something like Disco and, and show a process, um, instantly, you know, people say, you know, I want that. You know, that that's I, I can see that we could never see our processes like that before. And they didn't necessarily know that they could do that. Some there, we often find there are people in the organization um, trying to use things like Excel to, to take the audit logs and, and try and make some of those sorts of measurements. But the ability to sort of look at it in a global fashion across the whole process and be able to interact with the data in that way um, is something that I think. Uh, 
any, any process owner would want, but maybe they just don't know that the technology exists to be able to do it. I, sh I share that experience um, in, in that sense that um, I have two, two situations where on the one hand there was uh, like this experience, well I didn't know this technology existed and these powerful visualizations are there and these, these analysis, uh, this analysis power. The other, uh, for example, is, is that uh, all we do this already in visual and PowerPoint, and so what's new? Say, so, well, try and visualize this then in PowerPoint and visual, and, and, and visual with one push of the button. Well, I know there's one vendor that did it in Excel, but it, it, it's, it's like um, um, really important that a process owner gets to know this technology because he then also gets this feel of I can really get control of my processes. Now I know what's happening. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I fully agree with, uh, with Frank and the others that uh, the awareness could improve a lot. But at the same time, we should also be, uh, let's say, not too impatient. It's an extremely young area. It's not that long that there are event data around, so it's also quite natural that, that things are happening. One can also compare it, what is the actual use of simulation? So any business student gets a simulation course, which organization, some organizations buy a simulation tool but they never use it, very few organizations really use simulation. The same is with data mining. Everybody knows what data mining is. Every, at every university you will get it as a course. But how many organizations are really using it? And so if we think relative to the attention and the awareness that is, pre is present, it's a big success already. Yeah. yeah. If I were to add something, I would say it's um, <clears throat> What you have in a process mining space, or with process mining as a technology, is we have a very generic technology that can be used in a lot of different contexts and for a lot of different problems. And what we have to face, I think, is that while it is a really great blessing, it's also a curse because every success story has basically 90% of the people who really can't put themselves completely in the shoes of the person who has had that great success. And you can always write it off as something, some unique snowflake or something like that. So I think. We haven't really nailed down a niche uh, where process mining fits like a glove, and, and that's not a bad thing. But if we had that, then I think uh, it would take off. So it's just a different type of technology, and it takes longer. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I think that's it. Yeah, I can also add that because uh, if, if you talk if you talk to really the, the business community, then um, they they really go for for okay, not the efficiency thing and not 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 the, the blurry things as as we we've, we've improved uh, or the, the the visibility in these kind of things. But they they want sometimes they want just figures, and that's that's what I find out also today in these cases, which was different in that they combined the the customer interactions, customer value, with what was really well, internally going on. I, I remember myself having these, uh, seeing these, these, and I, I also failed with some, some projects. So there such, should be some projects that really failed over here in, in really defining some, some very fine efficiency improvements and so on. And then afterwards finding out that this, and we, we, we simply eliminated some of these, uh, these uh, uh, exceptions. But afterwards, we found out that these exceptions were really valuable to a certain segment in the market, so it took longer and, and, and so on and so on. So that's, uh, that was the end of the story of this uh, process mining exercise. Well. But, but I think well, combining this, and, and I had a, a couple of, of uh, discussions also here going on, that uh, it's always in the combination, because process mining in itself, mm, yeah, it's nice, it's, it's a good technique, but it should be combined with different things. And it will be combined, as you see in, in, in uh, your presentation of the Internet of Things and all these kinds of uh, things coming together. Um, that's uh, where I think it will become the true value. And uh, when we have that, well, I think this will boom. And, uh, and, and I really believe that. So, so uh, I don't know whether there are some other perspectives on that.
view. <laughs> The, the, the inter inter interesting thing of the uh, it taking off with the Internet of Things, I also talked about it briefly in my workshop, is I have this uh, up yeah. band, and so I'm measuring my steps and my, my health and uh, my sleep uh, pattern, um, but I'm just testing it. So I'm testing it for my wife, uh, so she can have, like, say, a subject uh, to determine if she wants to take this in her lifestyle coaching and use it with uh, advice on your diet, etc, etc. <laughs> but if, if more people say like accept that uh, measuring your health and all kinds of things is um, convenient, I think then it will really take off because uh, we, we have this, still this like say uneasy barrier well, like say my fridge will order my my uh, my my groceries when it's empty. Uh, what? Like say my smart meter can just just knows exactly what kind of appliances I have in my home because of the power usage. So it's you just you need to adjust to this new reality, and that's I think also part of where where. Well, what we also discuss is, is the, the ethical part in, in how far are we willing to go to measure everything and just to give ourselves, uh, like say, to the technology and, and interact and integrate with it. I find this a very interesting development and, and in, in my case I, I address this subject uh, because I thought, well, if if we do something wrong now, like the ING who produced this article on this, these customer data that they want to sell, that was made of it, then it can backfire. And people will say, like they did with data mining, I don't want you to know this. And, and, and what, I'm, what I'm finding very interesting is, is that I saw an article also, and I hope you can also react on this, is that was uh, Facebook are using uh, are going to use the click data of their customers for uh, targeted advertisements, and Google already does it. And I said to my peers at the Aubank, and when IG announces it, it's uh, 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 perceived as wrong. A bank may not do this. So we're at the, at the, at the turning point. They were like, from which companies and which um, environments are we accepting all these uh, new technologies and, and, and measurements, and, and from which parts of the industry don't we accept this? So just on that one bit, I know we're going off yeah. now uh, to another direction, but it's important to remember one thing. If you're not paying for it, then you are the product. Okay? And this is Facebook and Google's business model. You're not paying for those services, you are the product. Uh, I am a product, so we should not be surprised that we are being optimized, uh, because we're the product. So, um, but just getting back to the, the uh, adoption piece, uh, there's something important I think that, that Mark said. Uh, one thing that I am seeing which I think is very positive, well two things, very positive. One, um, there's definitely more and more people now in the say process improvement professionals or practitioners who recognize that the only real way to, to, to make a big difference is to build a toolkit. So going back a few years, you had people who said, oh, I'm a lean guy, okay. and, and I'm a Six Sigma person, and I'm a blah, blah, blah. And everybody would have their own favorite thing. And we're seeing more and more people now saying, no, no, no we realize we need a toolkit of different kinds of approaches and technologies, and then we need to work out how, when, when to apply which one. I think that's a very positive thing for process mining because and I, I saw this in many of the talks, people talking about how uh, this t technique can fit in with other things that we need to do. So, you know, improvement workshops and so on that we find often in league and things like that. Uh, and I think this is really, really important. And one of the things I want to see happening going forward is for more integration of this community in with that community and more sharing of ideas and, and, and knowledge. Um, and the other thing I think is a, just a big uh, momentum uh, push is that whole interest around big data 
because it's raising the level of awareness about the value of data, the value of machine data, of logs. People starting to think, ah, okay, this stuff is not just stuff I have to stick on a disk somewhere and then hope it doesn't, you know, you know, I can put it on tape and then forget about it. Um, it's stuff that may actually have value, and, and I think that is a, a good force. Now the problem is that it is such a big hype, so much confusion, people getting you know crazy, stupid ideas. It could also backfire. But I think if we're smart, this could be a really strong, positive momentum. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think on, on the subject of tools and the, the toolkit, I think um, it, one of the things that we see a lot of organizations working when they're working in things like trying to implement process mining and, and data science in general is there's a bit of a cultural shift that has to take place, particularly in large enterprise organizations, because um, the culture in IT within large enterprise organizations is very much towards standard systems applied across you know, the organization as much as possible. And, and you know, if we come in and say, we want to do some, some data science you know, and um, we want to run a project, you know, the first thing sometimes that happens is they assign a project manager and say, okay, in week 13, um, you know, what result are you going to have on this day? And, and at which stage is the data integration going to happen? So that's not quite how, you know, these sorts of things work. It's, it's, it's very much, uh, you know, being able to experiment with new technologies, being able to, to fail fast, as the sort of IT sector likes to say. And, and the clients that we're seeing that are really successful in that have sort of allowed some sub-teams within the organization to have a lot more freedom around what tools they use in order to fail fast, you know, not applying a project management um, project management approach to saying, in week 13, did you hit this bit on your Gantt chart, but saying, you know, what are your broader objectives, and, and being able to come out with suggestions for the overall organization, and, and building out what that toolkit is, and, and one of the aspects of that is figuring out what doesn't belong in that toolkit, and sometimes it's, you know, only if you try it and it fails, do you get to that point. So a couple of points, you know? so that, that's about the, like, um, yeah, having, I think that's also a point that Frank made in his talk earlier, like that you, as a company, you need to make room for people to get started with this, basically based on the belief um, that it will be useful and that it will yield results. And actually, um, so I don't know if you, like, it's a big stack of, of things. So, so that's, that's a very important point, though. I'm sorry, I'm getting very excited now. <laughs> now that's a really important point, and I've forgotten, because Frank, you, you said something really, really important. Uh, I think in your talk, you when you were talking about how you first started and you showed your curve, you expressed your work as innovation cycles. Now this is really important because actually the people I see already in this, most of them they don't think of this as innovation, they think of it as continuous improvement, uh, kind of in that area. It's about uh, business as usual, it's about incrementally chipping away at cost or, or, or experience improvement. And you put a box, you managed somehow to put a box around this and uh, really, uh, like you just said, uh, Nick, create this space where the organization had more freedom to experiment. And that seems to be a very interesting, I, I had not realized that until this moment. That seems to be very important and it's different from how a lot of people think about this stuff, I think. Good. Uh, is that just me? Or? No, no, I agree, and I think it's interesting because um, actually, I mean, there is uh, some 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 uh, discussion in companies today about how can we be innovative, how can we like uh, science of innovation, how can we, you know, have separate teams? But it's usually about product development. It's not so much about how can we maybe adopt new techniques. Uh, so, so I think it ties in there. Um, maybe maybe this is a good summary of the real of one of the real success factors is that you have freedom to innovate and to fail. <laughs> and actually, I think so. That reminds me of a point. Uh, once I was talking to Frank uh, about this, uh, we were talk discussing about that, and uh, um, I think you told me, or I did, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, about the Lean Six Sigma initiatives that are um, quite frequent, and many companies do have these uh, initiatives. So, uh, how do they make, for example, the business case before they get started? And um, um, yeah, and, and then the answer was, well, basically, it's the belief. Um, the buy-in in the in the yeah the methodology and the, that it's a good approach and that we just should get started and get some first wins. So I think it's an important point too. If we think about the, what you can do, yeah. And maybe one more point about the Lean Six Sigma. Uh, on the one hand, um, well, they are um, you, you're saying the toolkit is. Um, yeah, being extended, people are taking on more things, but is this something that you observe? So I, for example, have seen that also, for example, in Six Sigma, people are quite also sticking to their tools and not they're not exactly 
you know, screaming for post mining to, to get started with that. It's a, mm. But is, is that changing? Is it not it's not changing. shared or how? Mm. I think it, it, it really is changing because uh, I also, also made part of the analytics uh, part of the analytics team at Gardner. And there we have a lot of requests uh, today about the advanced analytics and all the, this, this, this stuff. And analytics to the, for the masses, which I believe much less. <laughs> but uh, there, there, there is indeed a lot of questions come from uh, small projects and so on and programs around uh, Lean and Six Sigma where they say, okay, we have now these things, we are as lean as hell, let's say, but uh, we, we didn't really come up. Uh, let me give you the story of, of a big bank uh, who is also here present, uh, but uh, I went to the headquarters of Belgium where they said, okay, we, we have had all this stuff in lean and we know that these processes and, and so on are really efficient and so on and effective and they are green and, and so on. And then the, 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 the top executives, they said, yes, but this, this, this process that is very well and so on, we lost customers. And this process where you said, wow, this, we need some improvement budgets, well, we gain customers. And we, so how do you explain that? So that they need really some, some, some things coming together and really some, some uh, effectiveness and so on. So it's all about these combinations. So I think there's a lot of things coming together. And you know, I'm also very interested in, in time series analysis and, and making predictions. So, so uh, um, I can be, only be uh, enjoyed uh, by, by what's coming to us. And, uh, okay. I try to get this to our customers. Yeah. I think um, you know a lot of the organizations that we work with do have uh, Lean Six Sigma or similar programs uh, going on, and I think one of the things that really helps us collaborate with those teams is, is when we say you know those those types of processes really originated in manufacturing or at least originally, and and, and the objective there was that you could really measure or observe. You know, you could walk down a production line and, and, and make measurements about when defects were made. You could study the defect in a product and see at what step it happened. And I think the challenge that organizations face in trying to apply that methodology to to a knowledge worker base is that it's very difficult to see what's happening. And I think where the value that process mining provides to those groups is, is the ability to make those data measurements. Because I think everybody agrees on the, the, the philosophical aspects of, of things like Lean Six Sigma identifying sources of rework and things, uh, reducing defects and things. But how do you measure when a defect occurs? How do you measure what caused it? And I think that's where process mining can really, really help those teams out a lot. Yeah. Well, maybe one, one point I would like to get back at that was raised earlier. Um, it's like, uh, so maybe the question would go to Will, uh, talking about the data science and, and you're very passionate about the things that can be done and that should be done, we can do much more. If you if you compare that to what Neil said, well, the customers that I see, they're working with Cesio, uh, with PowerPoint, with Excel. So isn't there a huge gap? How, how, what should, how should we interpret that? Yeah, so, so I see it a bit as a race. And of course, there are many, uh, many organizations that can still survive in the way that they are surviving, and, and, and some of them will also survive for a longer time. But I think uh, in recent times, things are really changing. Lots of things are transparent. If you think about banks, for example, the performance of banks can be compared much more easily, and it's much more a fight based on analytics and all kinds of things that there are a lot of other things. So, so I think that that many companies will go out of business and I've been involved in many projects where people where large teams would model processes forever, make large, large repositories uh, with models. I've never seen the business case for that. So if you see that organizations can invest in things like that, they should get advice from companies like you to do something different, <laughs> yeah. to make a better investment, and to do it based on facts rather than people drawing pictures. Yeah. 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 No, okay. So, uh, just to, to really reinforce your point, I, I recently, I, I, well, I can't mention them, I don't think, um, but you can probably guess. So, they're a global beverage manufacturer, a phenomenally important brand around the world. <laughs> not Dutch. Uh, hmm? Dutch? No, not Dutch. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, uh, no, I think it's so. Uh, there. Uh, but, but so they were so excited. I, I met them uh, and we had a, a big long talk, and they were so excited to tell me about their BPM initiative. And we talked a bit, and then 
so I said, well, okay, to explain what you've actually achieved then. They said, we have modeled in ARIS 1,200 processes. Array. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, okay, that's great. And, and so what, what happened next? They said, well, we've got another 200 to go. <laughs> So to, to, to add to the, to the question, what, what interests me at this point in time is, um, uh, is that when I started this process mining uh, crusade within the Rabobank, uh, I was the only internal employer that was doing this. Well, I could not create room, say, for other internal employment employers to uh, learn what I've learned. So I had to uh, pick up all consultancy parties who I trained myself <laughs> to do my work. Um, and at this point in time, it's very interesting. Is is that we are also looking at, uh, at combining all these all these disciplines. And, and, and we had at like say say like so, so sort of introductionary uh, meeting for two hours. And from the 13 people in the room, there were three internal and 10 external people and the challenge that we as a company face is uh, if we want to survive how do we train these people or attract these kinds of uh, people to do this analysis with <laughs> and for us you have to send them all to the data science yeah. faculty yeah. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> uh, and i think we're getting into a good like, closing uh, Discussion here, so we also have to make sure we, we close before the soccer match. But I just want to make sure is there any any other point any of you wanted to mention about this, or is there any question from the audience you wanted to, to join in at this point before we close? Yes? I've got a slight question. So I've been mentioned by so many people in LinkedIn that uh, it's an 80 20 kind of job, data scientist. You spend 80% of your time preparing the data, 20% of the time doing the, the analysis. Yeah. Is that a change, you think, in the future? As the process itself is Yeah, <laughs> yeah so the question was um, it had been mentioned by myself and others that, that data scientists often spend 80% of the time um, loading data, cleaning data, getting ready, maybe only 20%, and actually, maybe even much less, doing real analysis in terms of uh, getting to results. And um, I think um, there's a lot of efforts being made in. in, in streamlining that data ingestion workflow and i'm pretty confident that in the coming years that that's going to shift so it's uh, you know hopefully the majority of time being spent doing analysis um and uh you know the biggest challenge today is really because the data is often so fragmented around the organization um and a lot of the tools and things being developed uh large data repositories some of the methods for ingesting things into hadoop are really designed to um make sure that the data scientist has one shop that they can go to to get their data, or at least as much of it as possible. And if that's available, then, then it, it means that the data scientist can spend a lot more of their time doing real analysis. And I, I definitely see it moving in that direction. I'm optimistic in the next few years that we can maybe shift that to be majority analysis. But in the time being, it's, it's, it can still be a big challenge a lot of times. Yeah. So, so we're already seeing some companies enter this space and doing just that. So just providing tools to improve the workflow around, uh, you know, you think of it like ETL for the modern world, yeah. Uh, and I can see it's only going to get more and more because you think about what happened with the wave of data warehousing in the 1990s, the rise of ETL tools, you know, Informatica, the size it is now purely because of that. Uh, we're going to see it in the next couple of years. We'll see some, I think, a lot of advance, many people moving into this space because it's such an inefficient process and people just want to get to the value. Um, so it's a problem, there's an obvious benefit to solving it. I, it's already happening, so yeah. <laughs> so, 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 I think it all relates a bit to the value of data. Also a comment that Frank made, made before, uh, data has an incredible value. And it is a waste of time that today we are spending so much time on, on cleaning data and all kinds of other things. I think when we design new information systems, we should design them having events in mind, uh, requiring them in the proper way. But you also have to realize that, for example, for a company like, like SAP, it is close to impossible 
because they would need to refactor the, their entire system to do that. So data has value and it requires tremendous efforts to record them in the proper way. But also the, the point that Frank earlier made, you, one should also look at the value of the data from the perspective of uh, who is the data about. And I think what we will see next to, to being able to extract data better, recording data better, that end users will need to have a say in what is happening uh, to, to the data. And I think that is going to create uh, very interesting uh, problems for us. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, how you can still do analysis and ensuring the level of privacy that the people would like to have. Well, I, th I thank you all. Oh, one more question. Okay, please. It's a quick comment on that. I think you're about to face a major digital divide. The Europeans are taking a position that the rest of the world may or may not take. And that will create amazing opportunities, definitely, depending where you are. That's just a comment on what you yeah. said. It's a very Eurocentric view. I, I agree. And, and, and uh, the, 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 the strange thing is that, that I've also given these types of talks for, uh, for an audience that are not experts in the area. And this is always the thing that pops up. But it's always people using software products uh, that come from uh, other continents, which is quite surprising. And so I think also people in Europe have a kind of dual-sided view on, on, on things. So. Yeah. Uh, I, I can maybe can, uh, I can maybe, sorry, I can maybe add to that that uh, we, we have recently some some figures about that, and that's also discuss, discussed in, in, in cloud. If you have, for example, private cloud, that's not an issue anymore in, in the US. It's an issue here in, 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 in Europe. So if you even begin talking about private cloud in, in, in the US, I said, come on, <laughs> we grow up, it's, it's, it's all public. So that's uh, something to add. Uh. <laughs> So we, Kristen and I, we, we are very happy uh, that you are all here, that you could join us for camp. And I especially want to thank the panelists for joining us in this closing discussion. I think we could bring in some of the themes we had throughout the day nicely together here in this discussion. And I want to thank all of you for making the trip here from so many different places and for being a part of the Prosman community. Um, we will have dinner downstairs. Um, there are drinks. You you can you know have as much as you want. You just show your badge and we'll give you something. Uh, I hope you stay around a little bit more. We can have uh, some discussions, and we hope to see you again next year.